Hi, everybody. Hello. So before we begin, I'm going to play a little clip because a lot of people don't really understand what sports psychology is or what guys like me do when I get into people's heads and mess with their minds. So I'm going to play just a little bit of a clip to give you an idea, and then I'm going to teach you some ideas um, that you may take with you into your own endeavors. So be patient with me if you would. My name is Dr. Gio Valianti. I'm a professor at Rollins College and a mental game consultant to some of the best golfers in the world. Dr. Gio Valiante may be the most recognizable name on the PGA Tour that you've never heard. I grew up playing the game, and then I put the game away to pursue academics. But what happened was interesting. I was learning a type of psychology out of what's called social cognitive theory that was not yet being applied in sports. As I was learning about social cognitive theory, I just kept taking notes in my book thinking, this applies to golf. Well, that's golf. Well, that's golf. That's golf. So what I did is I was the first one to take social cognitive theory and start applying it to golfers. Understanding it may not be simple, but simple is the goal. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've never had a golfer call me with the complaint that he's keeping the game too simple. As a round of golf unfolds, my guys tend to get more and more free as things unfold, while the field is accumulating this stuff, we're offloading it. So theoretically, as you're doing this process, your freer swings are coming later in a round of golf because you're not accumulating all this toxic nonsense. Yeah. So the ultimate goal is that a golfer is able to play fearless golf. Now, how to do that is different for different golfers because people have different fears. Different things clutter the mind. So the degree to which we can remove fear and free the mind is the degree to which we can be successful in helping them play better golf. What we're doing is we're replacing frustration, negativity, uh, embarrassment, whatever, with acceptance. You don't have to like it, but if you can accept it, what happens is your brain starts to learn, you know what, there's no pain associated with golf and that's where freedom begins. So a golfer who's getting cluttered with too much information, his brain locks up. And you can actually see it sometimes, a golfer standing over a golf ball, unable to actually pull the golf club back because he's got so many thoughts happening in his head at the same time. Pull the trigger, come on. Pull the trigger. So when I watch a golfer struggle, Sorry. my job is not to prevent that. And this is what I try to tell my athletes right up front. My job is to teach you how to handle and to manage your adversity in a way that you're not getting worse, that you're not beating yourself up, that you're not prolonging a slump. You guys who are such high achievers spend so much time beating yourselves up that you're conditioning your own fear. And what we want to do now is stop that cycle by replacing disappointment, depression, frustration with either acceptance or humor. The more clearly you can think and the more focused you are, the better you play. And that's kind of the focus of our work, is just seeing things clearly and maintain that clear thinking all the time. Gio has taught me a lot of good stuff. The first thing we do is try to look at the big picture. Everybody that plays on the PGA Tour has its own little weak areas. The most important thing is to understand that that's normal. And you can't argue with the results. Under his guidance, Valiante's clients account for 55 PGA Tour victories, including many major and players' championships. People are not going to hire me because they like me. I mean, they've got to see results. So therein lies the responsibility of a sports psychologist to teach a golfer how to unclutter his mind. The habit of freedom and the habit of detachment. Every cell in your body, all in. Shut the routine down, let it go, let it go, and you're out, right? 20 seconds of greatness. And while golfers have used sports psychologists for many years, it was Tiger Woods that took it mainstream. Tiger Woods was so mentally tough. He was doing things that up to that point in golf seemed undoable. Specifically, how he would take a lead into a Sunday round of golf and extend it. So he really ushered in and sort of opened the channels for sports psychology. And Wood's historic success represents the ultimate goal. 
what Tiger Woods did was show us for a period of time the high water mark, what's actually capable. And the question that fuels me, that keeps me doing what I'm doing, is to see whether or not there's actually another level. So thank you for having me today. It's a real honor to be here. Congratulations to all of you for going to the Darlington School. It's a really incredible place. Um, in fact, since I am going to be up here, is this, is this mic? Is this OK? All right, yeah. So I want to talk to you just a little bit. We have about 30 minutes together. And essentially what I want to impress upon you is the power of the mind, the power that you all have between your two ears to be amazing at whatever it may be. So as you saw from the clip, actually, I'm going to fix this because there's no way I'm going to be able to stay still. So I got to move when I talk. So the one thing I want you to take away from what you just saw is this. And this blows my mind away to, to this very day. In the last 15 years, golfers that I have worked with I'll go back just a little bit, have won about 60 PGA Tour events. Now, mind you, as a psychologist, nobody ever wants to call me. People call me when they have to call me. They call me when they are in a slump. And simply by changing their minds, how they think they've gone from being in a slump to winning, without giving a golf lesson or changing their golf swing. So the area I work is what are called achievement domains. And an achievement domain is anywhere in life that has a measurable score. So go ahead and click it. In athletics, there's a scoreboard. In academics, there's grades. And of course, in investing or in the business world, there's money. So what you come to realize is in every one of these areas where you're competing to try to be really good at something, there are common patterns. These are called achievement domains. Go ahead. So this is Camila Bajegas. You saw him in the clip. Camila was as high as the number sixth ranked golfer in the world. Let me tell you a little bit about Camilo. Camilo has 3% body fat. He wakes up at 5 a.m. every day. He jumps on his bicycle when the sun rises, and he rides his bike from Jupiter, Florida, down to Miami and back, about 120 miles in the morning. And he gets home, and he has lunch. And then he rests. And then he does two sessions of P90X workouts. And then he rests, and he eats. And then he goes and practices golf for five hours and then he eats dinner, and then he goes to bed, and he wakes up the next morning, and he waits for the sun to come up so he could jump on his bicycle and ride to Miami. And I say that to you to give you an idea of how hard people work at the highest level to be the best in the world at something. Go ahead. This is Sergio Garcia. He's also one of the top golfers in the world. One time he went head to head against Tiger Woods and he had been saying some not very flattering things about Tiger in the media. And so after Tiger Woods beat Sergio, Tiger Woods sent out a text message to his friends and he said, I feel bad, I just bludgeoned Tweety Bird. And I say that to you to give you an idea of how mentally tough you have to be at the highest levels, because you are all going to go out into a world that is globally competitive. And what's going to determine whether you're the best at whatever you do or not is largely going to be a function of your mental toughness. In the PGA Tour, you not only have to compete, but sometimes you lose. And if you lose, Sometimes you lose publicly. 
and you have to be tough enough to deal with it and bounce back. And sometimes people even make fun of you a little bit, and that's okay. This is Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard's a center in the NBA. And he's so good that other teams have had to devise a plan for stopping him. They call it hack -a howard Essentially, other teams recruit extra players to foul him. So they'll send a guy in, they'll follow him five times, that guy will foul out, they send another guy in. But here's the thing. Dwight Howard has no one to complain to. He can't say, hey coach, that guy's being mean to me. He can't say, hey, that's, that's not fair, that hurts. He's got to be so tough that he works through all that and still finds a way to be the defensive player of the year, which he's done three times. Continue. And so the, there are four ideas that I want to share with you that work in competitive domains. So that as you leave Darlington and you go out into the world and you try to be really good at something, there are about four main ideas that really create excellence in achievement domains. The first one is what's called Kaizen. And Kaizen is a Japanese term that translates to improvement. Essentially it means it's a process of continual improvement every day. So the way this works is I work with my clients and I, we wake up, I have them call me in the morning and I ask them a simple question. I say, okay, what is one thing that you can do today and be better than you were yesterday? And it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be, you know what? I could be nicer. I could be more humble. I could be more confident. I could work harder in the gym. I could concentrate when I practice. I can have a better, it doesn't matter what it is. So long as you find one thing a day that you want to be a little bit better at. Because what happens is, if you throw yourself into this process, eventually all these skills converge and you're really good at a lot of things. But more importantly, is you develop the habit of improvement. Now, why is this important? This is one of the things that Tiger Woods said in the peak of his career. He said, and this is Kaizen embodied, the greatest thing about tomorrow is I will be better than I am today. I will be better, he goes, and that's how I look at my life. I'll be better as a golfer, I'll be better as a person, I'll be better as a father, I'll be better as a friend. He said, that's the beauty of tomorrow. There is no such thing as a setback. The lessons I learn today, I apply tomorrow, and I will be better. The reason this is so profound of an idea, and why he's been able to win a hundred times worldwide is this. Raise your hand if in your life you have ever made a mistake. I don't see every hand. There's some perfect people in here. Let's try it again. Raise your hand up high if you've ever made a mistake. All right, better, better, better. Now raise your hand if after making a mistake later that day or the next day or even a week later, you're walking around and you're dwelling on that mistake and you're thinking, I'm such an... Can I say idiot? <laughs> Head of school? It looks like you did. <laughs> it looks like he goes, it looks like you did. And, you're tell and the self-talk you're having is, Oh, man, what a, what a dumbbell I am. What am I thinking? Raise your hand if you ever dwelled and beat yourself up over a mistake. Right? Right? True story. When I was in college, I got invited to go on a, a fancy date 
with a girl that I'd had a crush on for three years. And finally, my senior year, she invited me. It was a cruise, on a cruise with her sorority. I was so excited to finally have been invited by this girl that as we're walking to the cruise ship on the, the marina, I was so excited that my friends were finally seeing me with the girl of my dreams that what did I do? I proceeded to walk right off the dock. I did. In a tuxedo. At her formal of her senior year, the culminating event of her college career, she has the wisdom to invite me as her date. So naturally, being a gentleman, I did what any person would do in that situation as they're falling off a dock. You reach for something to grab onto. And what did I grab onto? My date. And as we're falling into the ocean, I'll never forget it because it happened in slow motion to me. She says to me in the moment, she says, what are you doing? Splash. True story. And I say that to you because there's nothing in your life that you're going to do that's more humiliating than falling off a dock with the girl of your dreams in front of hundreds of people who were already on the boat. <laughs> laughing at us, swim to shore. Now here's the lesson. Mistakes happen in life, all, and they come in all forms. The beauty of Kaizen and the beauty of Tiger Woods is that you learn not to define yourself by your failures and by your mistakes. They happen to everybody, some more spectacularly than others. But what Tiger's philosophy says is, don't look to yesterday, look to tomorrow. And that's the process that leads to the, arguably the greatest athlete in the history of sports. Certainly the most prolific winner. This is what's called a trend line. Those of you taking statistics here have learned about it. This is what a successful life looks like. People think that a successful life is all about being perfect all the time, but that's not true. A successful life, and this is the greatest athletes of all time, what you realize is you peak, and then you go through a little bit of a slump, and then you peak again, and then you go through a slump, and then you rise like the phoenix every time. And I share this with all of my athletes, and here's why. What determines whether you're successful at the top has everything to do with what you do when you're in a slump in life. See, we all go through times where we walk around feeling bad about ourselves. There's no escaping that. There's no escaping that. I mean, I just told you the time of when I fell into the water with my crush, but I didn't tell you the time when I was in fifth grade and all of our classes had come into the auditorium to practice for the school play. And I loved to sing. I still love to sing. But as you all now know, I don't have a particularly good voice. Whenever I call, like the airlines or anyone, and, I say, and they say, hey, how can I help you? I say, well, I'd like a ticket. They say, just a moment, ma'am. Happens every time because I have apparently a very high voice. So I was singing for my fifth grade play, and Mrs. Palmer from the other class came over to me, and she was listening, and I thought I was going to get the lead. And she looked over at me, and she said, Hey, Gio. I said, Yeah. She goes, Just mouth the words. <laughs> she told me to stop. What if I start crying right now and just like walk out? Would that be the greatest lecture ever? 
if I just leave, depress everybody, and then leave. That's my goal. No. I say that to you because we all accumulate these experiences in life, but the degree to which you can have a sense of humor about them and not define yourself by them, and again, arguably, I've, I've got a pretty good resume. I've won a lot of things in my life. But me, like everyone else, it has not been the smoothest of paths. Don't forget, Steve Jobs, who invented Apple, who invented the iPhone, dropped out of college. Oh. Don't Steve Jobs was fired from his own company. Right? So there's a path to success, and this is what it looks like. So as your life begins to look like the blue line, what I always teach people is you be the orange line. Through your adversity, stay consistent. Always be nice, even when people are being mean. Always be confident, even when you're not playing particularly well. Always have a sense of humor, even when you feel sad, right? That's what the orange line represents, is your values as the world goes up and down. Go ahead. Someone's gotta give me an idea on where we are with time as well. How are we on time? What time is it? Okay, good. Okay, so that's the first idea I want you to take is Kaizen. And Kaizen simply means get a little bit better every day. Try to find a way to improve. It was easy for me. <laughs> Just don't walk off a pier and then better than I was the day before, right? So you set the bar low. Failure as a key to winning. I've already touched a little bit upon it. But one of the things, if you look at the Michael Jordans or the Tiger Woodses or the Jordan Speeds, we saw, raise your hand if you watched the Masters last week. Jordan Speeth, who's a friend of mine, was leading the golf tournament in the Masters and he, and he hit a ball in the water. So what did he do? He put a ball on the ground and hit that one in the water too in front of 12 million viewers worldwide. My friend failed spectacularly. But he's also won two major championships. And what you come to realize in the big leagues is that there is no success without learning how to fail. And I want you to really pay attention to my phrasing there. I'm not saying avoid failure. There is no avoiding failure. You have to learn how to fail in ways that you don't feel bad about yourself, get depressed, engage in bad, silly behaviors. Go ahead and hit that. The greatest phrase I've ever heard about winning, ever tried, ever failed. No matter. Try again, fail again, just fail better. People consider Einstein the greatest physicist in the history of the world. His theory of relativity is still the dominant theory in physics. And it's being proven time and again. But did you know that Einstein was a failure? His goal was to create one theory that unified the physical universe. He never did it, which is why there's a separate theory for small particles called quantum physics. Right? So they need two separate theories to describe the behavior of physical matter. Einstein was a failure. He just failed better than everybody else. And so the goal for you, as you go forward in your life, is to do everything as if there are no limitations. There's a famous quote by a football coach named John Lim Vince Lombardi, where he says, winning isn't everything, it's have you heard of that? Vince Lombardi says, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. But that's not what he said. What he actually said was, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing worth striving for. In other words, he wasn't silly enough to think you were going to win all the time. But what he meant was, if you're going to do anything, assume you're going to be the best in the world at it whether it's the violin, the triangle, stinker. I just taught a class and a girl made fun of me in front of everybody. 
So whatever you're going to do, be awesome at it. Try to be the best in the world at it. In 2010, golfers on the PGA Tour that I worked with set all sorts of records. They won almost 25% of every event that was played that year. And people started asking me, what's the secret? What are you telling these guys? Why do they keep winning? What happened was, I came to realize in the year before that the secret to success isn't only in how you focus or how hard you work. And What happens, and it probably happens to some degree at Darlington as well, is that we develop a sense of entitlement. We think that I show up somewhere and I deserve to be successful. I deserve to win. I deserve an A. I I worked hard on this paper. Why did I get a B? I deserve an A. And that's called entitlement. When we feel entitled to free things that we have not earned. And entitlement is a toxic value. If you're in a competitive domain and you want to be awesome at something, pride yourself on earning that thing. I'm not saying don't accept a scholarship if a scholarship is offered to you. You should accept these things. But always remember, you are entitled to the things in life that you earn. And that's true of love. It's true of respect, it's true of money, and it's true of friendship. That you deserve that which you earn. So what I did with all my athletes, starting in the beginning of the season, is I asked them three questions every week. What did you learn? Every Monday, what did you, that's Kaizen. Tell me one thing you learned last week. And I'd make them write it down, a simple thing. Right? I learned a new exercise. I learned how to write my name in cursive. I, I learned how to paint a certain style or in color. As a photographer, I learned how to use light, whatever. What is your purpose? A lot of times we wake up and we don't know what we're, what we're all about today. What are we trying to accomplish? So I regularly focus them. Here's your goal today. Here's your purpose. Be nice. Work hard eat better, something positive and healthy. And then I would throw a curveball at them. I would make them answer for me the question, what are you grateful for? I made them every day convince me that they had gratitude in their life. In your case, that you actually appreciate that you sit in this beautiful building, that you have friends, that you get to go to the Darlington School, that you have alumni who care enough about you to give their money to buy books, to build buildings, to help you be successful. Because a lot of times we go through life and we don't say thank you. We say it, but we don't mean it. And when you start to live a life of gratitude, If you're living a life of entitlement and you have no gratitude, you will end up with a dysfunctional life. Mark my words. When you go to college, you will see kids who are entitled and they'll be spoiled and they'll live a certain way and eventually they will implode or become president like Donald Trump. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. 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 I heard that in the class someone was talking about it on to good natured ribbing. If entitlement is here, gratitude is here, you need to flip the equation. Because a life of gratitude leads to excellence. I did that this year. My athletes lost their entitlement, started winning everything because they were mentally free. So gratitude. Okay. Yeah, four. 
And the last idea has to do with self-perception. And here's why. The brain is not a perfect machine. The brain creates meaning subjectively. So, for example, if a student turns in a paper to me, or three students turn in papers to me, and I put a B on all of those papers, student one will leave and say, oh, I made a B in Dr. V's class. He's the hardest grader in the whole campus. Wow, I must be pretty smart. And the second student will leave with that B, and that student will say, Ah, oh, B, ah, oh, man, boy, Dr. V is so unfair. I deserved an A. And a third student will look at that B and say, You know, he used to give me C's, but I've been working really hard, and now I earned a B. I guess that hard work leads to improvement. But what you see is people take three different lessons from the same experience. And that's how we create meaning, subjective meaning out of an objective thing. When Michelle Kwan, before she won the world championships in ice skating, in the Olympics, she finished second. And after she finished second, uh, a reporter went over to her and put a microphone in her face and he said, you just lost the gold medal in the Olympics, he said. You must feel really terrible about yourself. And she said, huh. She said, no. She said, I don't, I don't look at it that way. She goes, I didn't lose the gold, but I did win the silver. Both were true. She did lose the gold, but she also won the silver. And by focusing on the fact that she won the silver medal in the Olympics, she protected her confidence and later that year won the world championships. And so... The question becomes, what is this a picture of on the right, by the way? Raise your hand if you see a rabbit. Raise your hand if you see a seagull. Rabbit? Seagull, right? The answer is it's both. It depends how we look at it. When we look in the mirror every day, it does not matter what's in the mirror. mirror. What does matter is what you see when you look in the mirror. Life on the road to excellence is not designed to be easy. You will be told to mouth the words. You will be fall off a dock at some point, maybe not as spectacularly as I did. Someone you like may not like you in return. Count on it. It will probably happen. Someone you want to be friends with may not want to be friends with you. A teacher who you want to impress may not think you're all that smart. This is the rough and rocky road in life. Through it all, if you can continue to look in the mirror and find ways to like what you see, to have the values that are being taught to you here at Darlington of humility and gratitude and hard work, and you value art and music and sports and academics, and you live the Greek concept of a balanced life, that will produce the best you that is producible. Okay? Thank you very much.